Freddie, take it away. All right. Uh, well, thank you for that introduction. Um, as mentioned, I work at SIMS and NSSL in uh, Norman, Oklahoma. Um, and I am really interested in the idea of co-production of knowledge. Uh, so that would be working with forecasters throughout the whole um, research process. Um, so I'm really interested in not only presenting information today, but also in hearing your all's feedback, um, suggestions, anything that, that you think about uh, uh, the presentation um, today. So basically, oh, let's see if I can advance slides here. There we go. All right. So basically, our story begins with the... Uh, upgrade of the weather service radars to dual pull and back in the early 2010s and basically dual pull can provide new information about storm scale processes we have new signatures that we can look at now like zdr columns which provide some information about a storm's updraft and intensity there are also things like zdr arcs which give information about the storm relative wind as well as storm organization um, so lots of in interesting information. Um, but during a 2015 hazardous weather uh, testbed experiment that I was um, involved in, something caught my attention. Um, I was interested in rapid update data like phased array radars as well as dual pole. So I started asking forecasters who were involved in the experiment a question. Would you sacrifice dual pole data in order to have rapid updates? And week after week, unanimously, the forecasters very quickly said, yes, we would take, we would get rid of dual pole if it meant we could have rapid update data. So that got me thinking, well, dual pole, which I've read about, you know, which has a lot of good, um, what appear to be good applications, maybe it's not being used all that much. So I started talking to more forecasters and it did seem that perhaps dual pole is not widely used to make warning decisions. And that could be because there's not a lot of solid research just yet linking dual pole specifically to warning decisions. And how can a dual pole signature actually be used to make a warning decision or to support a warning decision? So what we decided to do is really focus on one signature, one dual pole signature, which is the ZDR column, um, and try to compare it to signatures that are frequently used by forecasters in an effort to really link it into existing scientific conceptual models. So to do that, we compared ZDR columns, which are just a vertical column of high ZDR. You can see an example of one over here on the right. And we compared the evolution of the ZDR columns to things like minus 20 C reflectivity cores and mesocyclones and storm reports all to get an idea of how they sort of interact with each other, how they might relate to each other. We used a couple different data sources. One was base data, so just ZDR, Z, correlation coefficient, um, to examine ZDR column evolution. So we did things like take vertical cross sections through the column, like what you might do in GR. We also looked at the max value of the ZDR uh, column at the column top. So what's the highest ZDR at the column top? We also looked at a, a um, experimental algorithm called the ZDR column depth algorithm, which basically just outputs um, a calculation of ZDR column depth um, across a latitude and longitude grid. So we performed this analysis on rapid update KOUN data. KOUN is a research radar here in Norman. We operated it using sector scans so that we could get rapid updates, basically volume update times of two minutes or less. We looked at 45 different storms. There were over 1,300 volume scans in our analysis. We had a pretty good representation of storm types, whether it be supercells, multicells, severe or non-severe storms, tornadic and non-tornadic storms. And we looked at storms over a relatively wide range of the year, but it is important just to, re to remember that we did not look at any cold season events um, in this particular data set. So in analyzing all of those uh, cases and examples, we came up with some conclusions or some results, if you will. Um, so the first of those are, there is still some uncertainty about how ZDR column evolution 
might relate to um, tornado genesis or tornado potential for a given storm. So the plot that's up now is a violin plot of the maximum height of a ZDR column determined by a vertical cross section. So just like in GR, when you put that vertical cross section through, we did that and we measured the, the maximum height of the 1 dB isosurface within a ZDR column. So that's what this violin plot shows. It's showing a distribution of all those different measurements. Now the width of the red area is just showing the number of uh, observations in that uh, at that point. So the wider the red area is, the more observations there are, and the skinnier that red area is, the less observations there are. And I've also um, overlaid traditional box plots on top of those violin plots, where the dark black line in the middle of the white box is just the median of the observations. So we've got the height of the ZDR column over here on the y-axis, non-tornadic storms or mesocyclones on the left, tornadic mesocyclones on the right. And at least using this measure, we did see some differences in the distributions. The median ZDR column uh, cross-section height for tornadic storms was greater than the median uh, for the non-tornadic mesocyclones, and this difference was statistically significant. But when we looked at things like um, the ZDR column height for tornadoes of different magnitudes or different EF ratings, things started to look a little bit more uncertain. Um, there was more overlap and it just was not clear that there was a, a strong relationship between the ZDR column and the intensity of the tornado. Now it's possible that a small sample size is an issue here. For example, we only had two EF4s in our data set. But when we looked across, when we looked across all of the storms using the ZDR uh, column depth algorithm, we saw different results where here there was very little difference between the distributions of the maximum depth of the column between tornadic and non-tornadic mesocyclones. So there's uncertainty in how this might relate to a storm's tornadic potential. And I think this is borne out in the literature as well, where what exactly is happening with an updraft prior to tornado genesis? Is the low level updraft strengthening while the upper level updraft is weakening? What impact might that have on the ZDR column? And so I think there's just still uncertainty here. This is an active area of research. So for this project, we really decided to focus in on ZDR columns for severe and non-severe storms. So that would be a severe storm would be just a storm that produced severe hail or wind, at least based on um, the storm data publication. And what we found was that ZDR columns are a pretty good distinguisher between those severe and non-severe storms. So once again, this is showing a violin plot of that vertical cross-section height of a ZDR column. And we do see a decent amount of difference between the distributions of a severe storm on the right, or of all severe storms on the right. There were uh, 24 of those, I believe, and non-severe storms on the left. Now there is still overlap. You can see, you know, you have ZDR column heights where there are severe storms as well as non-severe storms. So another way to look at this is using this plot, which is showing the percentage of volume scans at various thresholds of column height that were associated with severe and non-severe storms in our data set. So for example, if we take a threshold of ZDR column height of 7.5 kilometers, we can see that about 70% of the volume scans were associated with severe storms, whereas a little under 30% were associated with non-severe storms. If we take that back to our violin plot, 7.5 would be right about here. We can see that a pretty good chunk of the distribution for severe storms lies above that threshold, and a pretty good chunk of the non-severe storm distribution lies below that threshold. I'm not talking about using these thresholds specifically, you know, for, for warning decisions. It's just a matter of as the ZDR column height increases, you're more likely to see a, or it's, the storm is more likely to be severe, at least with this uh, uh, set of 45 storms um, that we used in Oklahoma. 
Um, and we can see a similar idea when it comes to um, what I've called the max column top ZDR. So this is just stepping up, maybe if you're using all tilts, stepping up to the top elevation angle where you can see one plus ZD or one plus DB ZDR within the ZDR column, and then measuring the maximum value of ZDR within the column. And so those values would be over here on the left. And once again, we see at least some difference, and this is statistically significant as well, some difference between the max ZDR at column top between severe and non-severe storms. Now, one thing that we saw in the analysis, because uh, remember I said we wanted to compare this with um, other radar signatures like minus 20 C reflectivity cores, we saw that the minus 20 reflectivity cores are also a, good, a pretty good distinguisher between severe and non-severe storms, maybe even better than ZDR columns. So why would we want to look at new data uh, or a new radar signature with everything that's going on during morning operations when reflectivity already seems to be given a pretty good idea of storm intensity. Well, what we found was that ZDR columns actually evolve prior to features in the minus 20 C reflectivity field. So this plot is showing lag correlations uh, in the blue line. Basically, any positive correlation at negative lag times means that the ZDR column is evolving before the minus 20 C reflectivity core. So these red dots are showing us where there is um, significant, uh, statistically significant correlations. Um, so for example, here at a lag time, or a, uh, this is all in volume scan, so a lag time of minus one um, means that we have a, a basically a lead time of 1.8 minutes. The average update time for all of our um, KOUN radar data was 1.8 minutes. So another way to think of it, this plot is basically saying that um, if you see a ZDR column intensifying, anywhere within the next 10 minutes, which is this negative six lag time here, anywhere in the next 10 minutes, you could expect to see the minus 20 C reflectivity core also intensifying. So what might this look like with real radar data? This is gonna be an example, uh, hopefully it animates, of a multi-cell storm uh, in early July in 2014. ZDR will be on the left, minus 20 C reflectivity is on the right. As we loop through this, you'll be able to see that the ZDR column develops first, and then about 10 and a half minutes later, we see the big minus 20 C reflectivity core develop. So really the, the ZDR column can provide information about a storm's updraft and how strong that updraft might be before you see a reflection of that in the reflectivity, which is basically that high concentration of raindrops and maybe big hail that is forming because of the strong updraft. So that's trying to link it into that updraft conceptual model. If you have a strong updraft, you might expect a greater chance of hail or strong winds at the surface. And this conceptual model can also apply to um, supercells as well as, well as multi-cells. So this is an example of a supercell in late May of 2013, where we have this really big strong ZDR column that develops about 10 minutes prior to this really obvious bounded weak echo region um, that develops near the end of the loop. Once again, this is just a way of saying uh, maybe drawing attention to a storm and saying, oh man, this storm has a really strong updraft. Maybe this is a storm to watch. I should also mention that this really strong ZDR column and as well as the B, the bounded weak echo region 10 minutes later did precede a 5.9 inch hail report um, at the surface. Now, granted, this is, a, this is kind of an extreme case, May 31st, 2013, uh, very, very strong updrafts, but it still illustrates that if you see an increasing ZDR column, it means you've got a stronger updraft, and that could, depending upon the strength of the updraft, result in severe weather um, at the surface. Now, with all of the good things that, um, that it appears that ZDR columns can provide, all that information it can provide, there are limitations, just like with many radar signatures. And those limitations are important to consider. Uh, one of the primary ones that we found was that large hail and three-body scatter spikes 
can mask out the ZDR column, especially if you have just a few large hailstones that maybe fall back into the updraft or fall around the periphery of the updraft, it can really mask out that ZDR column. So this is an example of a prolific hail producing supercell back in late March of 2017. This storm had multiple hail reports, including a baseball size hail. And so I've circled the area approximately where we would expect to find the updraft. But when we look at the ZDR field, there's basically nothing. ZDR is even negative. So we could have big hail or attenuation issues here perhaps, um, but there's no ZDR column. And even the ZDR column depth, uh, which is down in the bottom right corner, shows no output. So the algorithm is saying there's no ZDR column here. Obviously there's an updraft here if this storm is producing baseball size hail, but there must be some kind of contamination either from this three body scatter spike or from the hail itself that actually masks out that column. And in other, other cases that I've seen with prolific hail reports, I've seen same thing, the similar things where there's just really not much of a ZDR column. So in instances like this, it may not be possible to really use the, the ZDR column most efficiently. Another thing to consider is the, are those mesoscale environmental differences. Um, we're uh, showing a violin plot here again um, for two different supercells um, and the column depth size, so how big the ZDR column is. Supercell one here on the left produced an EF3 tornado, and this is actually May 31st, 2013, so this is the El Reno tornado, the 2.6 mile wide tornado. And then on the right is Supercell 2, which produced only a brief EF0 tornado, even though its ZDR column was bigger and um, greater in magnitude than Supercell 1's ZDR column. So what I think might have been happening here was there was cold outflow air from supercell one, supercell two was following right behind it and it was probably ingesting some of that cooler air, which at the very least made um, low level, very the very lowest low level instability um, less and probably decreased the tornado potential of this storm, even though its overall updraft might have even been stronger than the, than the, than the leading supercell that produced that tornado. So of course, in warnings, you know, ZDR columns are not, not a magic bullet. Um, just like you all always do, take that in when you take the holistic approach to warnings uh, where you're using radar data and environmental information and satellite data, all of that is of course still important. Um, we're just talking about maybe integrating one additional signature into those scientific conceptual models since ZDR columns do, attend, do appear to be a pretty good indicator of storm uh, updraft location as well as that intensity. The last thing I want to do in the present in the presentation today is just uh, look forward to the future. Uh, we are developing uh, ra uh, rapid update radars uh, currently and seeing how those might be effective in um, observing severe storms. And so all of the data that I presented so far has been using rapid update data. So volumetric updates of two minutes or so or less. But we, what we also did with that data set was we degraded it. We took out some of those volume scans to simulate uh, more traditional updates in the five to six minute range. And what we saw was that thankfully all of the results still stood. So severe storms still had stronger ZDR columns than non-severe storms. But what we saw was that the statistical significance was less and there might be a little bit less um, lead time in terms of anticipating, let's say, a, a hail report. So to give an example of that, this is the same case that I showed earlier, that multi-cell storm with that big ZDR column. But on the left, you'll see rapid updates, about two minutes. On the right, you'll see more traditional updates of about six minutes. And so what we can see is that you still see the ZDR column with traditional updates but you're missing some of the detail in the middle. Some of the faster changes, maybe even the, some of those peak values could occur in between the volume scans of the, of the traditional update um, data. So radar update time, it does matter. Um, and we saw this also when looking at the hail reports. Um, basically, this is just showing the, the 
distribution of lead time, what I'm calling the time between a maximum value in the ZDR column depth and when the hail report occurred. So the red boxes are rapid updates, and, or the red box plots are the rapid updates, the yellow box, box plots are the traditional updates. And then these values here are just the median lead time, if you will, for the time between the hail report and the ZDR column maximum depth. And so there is a difference in that lead time between the severe or between the rapid updates and the traditional updates. Um, all of the results that I've shown here are still valid with um, the update times that we currently have, five to six minutes or so, depending upon um, the scanning strategy that's being used. Um, but it does look like rapid updates are going to be um, advantageous um, for observing things like the ZDR column, especially if it's evolving quickly. So just to summarize, um, there uh, are new data available. It's been available now for several years. Um, it does appear to show um, useful information about storm scale processes and how a storm might be evolving, but it's not necessarily totally well understood yet, especially in terms of linking it to the warning decision process. So we really wanted to focus on the ZDR columns and showing how they could be related to current scientific conceptual models, especially with updrafts. So we found that ZDR columns, as well as the minus 20 C reflectivity cores, are good distinguishers between severe and non-severe storms. So that is, you might expect a um, stronger, taller ZDR column with a severe storm than a non-severe storm. Once again, there is less certainty about the tornadic and non-tornadic um, uh, storms, but that's an area of ongoing uh, research. And then most importantly, I think, for all of this conceptual model integration is we found that ZDR columns evolve prior to those features in the minus 20 C reflectivity, whether it's the reflectivity core itself, or maybe a bounded weak echo region, maybe even a three body scatter spike. These columns um, appear before those signatures. And I think that's really important for that updraft conceptual model because updraft strength is important. A stronger updraft might lead to bigger hail, or maybe if we're in an environment favorable for downbursts, we see a strong updraft pulse, what comes up or what goes up must come down. So we could expect perhaps that there would be strong winds at the surface in the future. And I really think that's a way of, incre of increasing that heads up time using ZDR columns, because you can see that updraft uh, magnitude earlier than using reflectivity alone. And then of course, as with many, many things in, in, in radar, there are some limitations that are important to consider. I think especially the masking of the ZDR column. Uh, that, was, that was definitely kind of dumbfounding for me the first time I came across it um, because I saw this you know, strong supercell with lots of, of, of hail reports and I can't find a ZDR column. And I'm like, why is there no ZDR column? There should be, this is a strong updraft. And I had to go talk to multiple different people and we basically came to the conclusion of, it's just masked out by that hail. Um, so those are important things to, to consider. Um, of course, with not only with ZDR columns, but with any radar signature um, as well. So with that, I thank you all so much for your time and be happy to take any questions if there are any.